Um, thank you all for being here and for all of those, uh, all of you who are joining virtually. I'm going to start um, with you, Ravi. You've just written this book about the smartphone revolution. Um, and along the way, you discovered um, the most popular person on uh, Google search was a woman named Sunny Leon. Tell us about Sunny Leon, why she is so popular, and what does her kind of journey through the internet um, tell us about India's internet and India's challenge at taming, dealing with the internet era? Sure. Um, so Sunny is clearly trying to wake all of us up. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are laughing, you know who Sunny Leone is. She is a former porn star who is now turned into a, a very successful actress and brand and endorser of products uh, uh, across India uh, and across South Asia, in fact. Um, for many years now, she has been the most Googled person on the Indian internet. And in general, in India, if you look at what people are Googling, it's mostly on smartphones. It's not on PCs, because most Indians who are active users of the internet are using smartphones, and they're, they're sort of mobile-first or mobile-only users. Um, for all of these Indians, uh, and mostly young Indians, I should, I should caveat, um, one of the things they tend to search for is, is Sunny Leone, uh, and they tend to search for porn. Um, and a lot of this comes from, I think, a sense of curiosity about you know, what pornography is, because many people come to the internet in India um, sort of thinking of it as this you know, vast universe, this vast library where they can discover different things, porn being one of them, which wasn't accessible before. And I think that, that's one of the things that's so important here. Here in the West, um, I would imagine many of you could probably hide a Playboy magazine under your pillow when you, know, when you were growing up. It's not so easy to do that in India. Notions of privacy aren't the same. Playboy isn't easily available. Um, PCs aren't easily available. So, you know, it's hard. And TVs and, and video cassettes and CDs and all of that stuff isn't easy, easily available unless you're very rich. And so for millions, in fact, hundreds of millions of Indians who are just discovering the internet on smartphones, um, porn has just sort of exploded into their lives in a, in, in a variety of ways that, you know, is quite dangerous potentially. Um, but one of the reasons why they can see it the way they can is because it's private. It's a small private device. Remember, the smartphone for most Indians is not only their first computer, it is also their first TV and their first mm -hmm. streaming device and their first MP3 player, their first camera. Uh, all of that enables them to engage with this kind of content in a way that simply wasn't possible before. So India now, um, according to some statistics, is the third or fourth biggest consumer of online pornography in the world, just behind mm. the US, the UK, and Canada. They expect that to grow. Expect India to be number one in the next five or six years. Um, just as more Indians discover the internet, discover porn, um, and are very curious and satisfy their curiosities, discover sex, and sexuality through pornography. And we can get into why that's terrible, but you can probably well, is imagine. Is it legal? It is legal. Um, there, was a, there was a moment where the Indian government tried to ban pornography. Tell us about that. So this, this was a few years ago um, when the government decided to, um, as you know, unfettered access to the internet and pornography took off, the government decided to ban um, access online Except very quickly it realized that that's something that they really couldn't do because it's very easy for new sites to spring up or ways to get around it. But also there was a massive uh, civil society sort of uh, outrage around that. Uh, and for good reason, because it's a slippery slope. Once you ban one thing, you could ban so many other things. Um, so that didn't quite work out. It is legal. Um, but, but even though it is legal, um, you know, th there are a variety of reasons why it's quite dangerous. Because you know, if, if your first notion of sexuality and sex uh, in a society where people haven't necessarily been sensitized to the human body, to the female body, um, if you're a young boy in a village and this is the first thing that you're seeing, um, it can have all kinds of ramifications, and, and it certainly is unhealthy, and it's an explosion that India needs to seriously consider and deal with. Does the internet, and particularly mobile internet, complicate um, India's efforts, you know, to kind of regulate free speech, free expression? Does the internet pose a new challenge 
Absolutely. It's, 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 it's just this new world that I don't even think India and the government are well equipped to deal with. I don't think they fully understand it. They don't understand the pace and scale at which it's growing. Um, remember, these are private devices, so it's not community-based the way, you know. So in 91, when, when the reforms took place in India and cable TV came in, mm. there was a sense that you could still control it in that, on the one hand, with broadcasters, you can crack down on what they're broadcasting. But, you know, the TV space was a public space, in a sense, either the living room or a larger room. Um, phones have changed all of that. I mean, you, you, you could be on a private device in your bathroom, and no one's going to know what you're viewing. And, and, and so that, that's really what's led to an explosion, not just in pornography, but also in the way Indians consume all kinds of things, from news to fake news. Um, and, and that has immense ramifications for a generation of young Indians who are now going to be digitally native. I want to come back a little later to the question of propaganda but, and also censorship. I wanted to ask you, Arundhati, about the young clients you represented in this landmark case over uh, gay rights. What really, one of the, one of the stories that, that, that really drew me were the stories of the young college students from all over India, from urban India, from small town India, who joined as petitioners to overturn this colonial era ban. Um, tell us about some of those young people. Why did they join the case? What was it like for them, for their families? And what does it say, do you think, about this generation that we're talking about? Right. Um, so the, um, the case that you're referring to is the petition filed by students and alum of the Indian Institutes of Technology. And as I'm sure many of you um, no, the IITs represent the aspirational story of, um, of Indian education. I mean, if there is an, in, an educational institution that can change your life in India, it is the Indian Institutes of Technology. Um, Prabhriti is an organization of 350 alum and students uh, who identify as LGBTQ. And of that organization, 20 young people came forward to challenge Section 377. Um, like you said, they came from all over the country. They came from Delhi, Bombay, um, you know, urban centers where we uh, know that there are gay people. But they also came from much smaller towns, um, Kakinara, Rachi. Um, and it re that case really, in some senses, defies the idea that um, that LGBT people or uh, you know LGBT rights um, or people make, making claims for LGBT rights in India are urban elites. Um, uh, but really, you know, they came from all over the country. They came from class and caste backgrounds that were very diverse. And I think what you know what we understood when they came to us originally is the aspiration that young India has. Because for these young people, you know, one they spoke about in, in the petition, we talk about the depth of um, mental health issues and disorders that, that they have faced in, in, in the process of coming to terms with their sexuality. And so it was really, um, you know, I mean, one is taken aback that on the one hand, you have these young people, men and women, who have aced this incredibly difficult exam. Um, who represent the elites of Indian education, and yet who could, and I think because they were young, they could speak m openly about um, what they had gone through in coming to terms with their own sexuality, but also the aspirations that they had for their future. So I think, you know, we had clients who were much older, who were in their mid 60s, and they had grown up in a completely different world, I think, where they could not imagine, um, a, you know, a life. Um, where the court would say that they are full citizens, that the Constitution's promise had been um, uh, you know, withheld for them, and that the Constitution belongs to them um, as much as it does to any other citizen. But for the young people who were their clients, they believe that um, you know, life is theirs, and um, um, that their lives are ahead of them. And, and they see, um, you know, it, it, I mean, to me, the one word was aspiration, uh, whether it's professional aspiration, whether it is personal aspiration in terms of you know, where, uh, where you should live, what kind of job you should hold, um, 
what kind of relationship you should be in, and, and in, in a sense, what your country owes you. I think that's what really came across from them. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great metaphor in some way of democracy mm -hmm. actually deepening over the course of 70 plus yeah. years, right? If you think that the Constitution is yours yeah. and that you do have the right to love who you want. I mean, what more fundamental right could there be? Um, and c can you describe what the court finally said in its verdict? Because I think that's, yeah. that's important to, to hear, for everyone to hear. Um, so one of the things that, that was most meaningful um, to me is that um, you know, the, the in Justice Hindu Malhotra says that history owes an apology to LGBT people and their families. Um, mm. So aside from the court's um, you know, declarations that the right to equality and dignity um, apply with full force to all citizens of India, um, there's also this recognition that um, you know, the uh, homophobia and, and coming to terms with your sexuality is not just something that gay people go through, but it's also um, uh, you know, something, a, a journey that their families take along with them. But I think the other big point that the court makes, and, and you know, something that I'd bring out here, is that um, the, the court protects gay people as a minority in India, understanding that the Constitution is intended to protect minorities, whether those are religious minorities, whether those are sexual minorities, mm -hmm. but that the, and, and um, you know, one of the judges, Justice Dhananja Chandraju, says this, that there's a, a constitutional vision of a society that is diverse and that is vibrant in its, in its diversity. So I think the, the implications of this judgment um, are not just for gay people as a sexual minority in India, but really to a wide array of of minorities. The IIT students who were your uh, petitioners, who were your clients, um, represent precisely this young generation that we are talking about. Um, India is home to the largest number of young people um, in human history at any recorded point in human history. The average age uh, in India, the median age now, I think, is between 26 and 27. It's under 27. Mm -hmm. Um, and just to give you a sense of how fast this youth population is growing, every month, one million Indians turn 18. Every month. Um, that's not just this year or next year, but from now until 2030. So it's an incredible youth bulge that this country is going through. Um, I am definitely an auntie when I <laughs> go to India. Um, James, I won't say whether you are referred to as uncle, <laughs> James, um, but I wonder if you can bring your um, economics lens to a country that is undergoing such a youth bulge. What does that mean for the economy? Creating one million jobs, potentially 10 to 12 million jobs a year at a time when the economy is increasingly automated is is kind of a big challenge, right? So what does this youth bulge mean for India's economic outlook? And specifically, what does it mean for there to be so many young people in a country that is so vastly unequal, which you have addressed very squarely in your book? Yeah, thank you. Um, um, so you're right. I mean, the figures that you gave are the ones that people tend to, to roll out, the, the size of India's youth bulge. It should be a great advantage all across Asia. So I'm sitting here in Singapore, all across Eastern Asia, Southeast Asia, people are worried about an aging population. And so they look at South Asia and India in particular with a source of envy that this is a country that is still young and vibrant. And in theory, uh, having a large young population ought to be economically beneficial. Young people are more innovative, they're more adaptable. Um, simply having a large and growing young population should expand your economy. So there's a bunch of reasons why in theory that should work. But as your question hints, in the end that doesn't matter unless there are jobs for these young people to do. You mentioned the statistic of one million a month. Uh, at the moment under Prime Minister Narendra Modi, India's job creation record is is quite poor. It might have been zero over the course of his 
um, four years in office. But uh, if it's higher than that, it's not a lot higher than that. It's nowhere close to the amount of jobs that are required. Then you have a much deeper problem. So India is going through this enormous wrenching transition from being a, an agrarian society to being um, a, an urban sort of industrial society. It's the same transition that China went through in the 1980s and the 1990s, but this, in a sense, is the the, the reason why Ravi's book is, has got its finger on the pulse of what really matters, that, that China, when it made this transition, it didn't have people who uh, had access to information through smartphones um, and who were less willing to be able to be told what to do by their government. In India, anyway, you have a democratic system which makes that more difficult, but it just means this transition is very difficult to make at the best of times. And in particular, India has struggled to create the kind of jobs that other Asian countries have given to their young people. So typically jobs in labor intensive manufacturing in, in factories. And even then, it's not clear that those are the kind of jobs that young people in India actually want. Um, the sort of jobs that allowed China or Thailand or Malaysia to become rich, where you were either working in a, in a factory or working in a Vodafone shop are not the kind of jobs that young people in India want. The problem is that the education system in India does not provide them with the skills to get anything better. And so I think this is the, the risk that India has this huge opportunity of a, of a youth bulge just at the moment when everywhere else around Asia um, economies are growing older. But some of the basic building blocks that you need in order to take advantage of that are not in place. And so the risk is that that young, huge generation burning with aspiration ends up becoming very frustrated with the political consequences that will follow from that. What are some of those building blocks? Well, I mean, you need ladders of opportunity. Um, in India, there is one ladder of opportunity which works very well, which is if you're fantastically good at mathematics, then you can whisk yourself up often from very limited circumstances and, and get into a, one mm. of the, the high class engineering institutions, um, the IITs, the IIMs, and then, you know, you, you, you can get access to, uh, you know, to good quality jobs in the service sector, in managerial sectors. But the problem is for most other people, those don't exist. The less, one of the lessons of East Asia is that you need to build basic systems of social support, you know, basic education systems, basic social safety net in terms of health care, pensions for the elderly, um, although that's not relevant to young people. Um, and if you don't have these basic building blocks in, in place, it's very difficult to try and find ways in which people who are built, who are born, you know, in limited circumstances can find their way to, to a better life. Um, and people know this. If you go and travel, as I did for my book and as, as others have done, um, on this panel in, you know, in Uttar Pradesh or Bihar, the kind of the heartland of India, these are not areas that are easy to escape. People do try and move to the cities to, to find opportunity, but, but escaping the circumstances of your birth is something that is quite hard to do in India. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's a really good point that goes back to Arundhati's observation of aspiration, you know, the escape uh, that James is talking about is very much what, what, what you were saying. In a country that's so young, that has uh, so quickly gotten access to the internet, the world at its fingertips, um, one would imagine a much more open country, a much more open society, a much more open um, uh, economy, um, a much more open spirit. And yet, what you see in India today is often the very opposite of that. Um, there are rising instances of uh, violence against religious minorities, um, growing intolerance against ideas of, of all kinds. And I wonder if each of you want to just take a stab at and not intended at the the intolerance and violence um, that simmers in a country that is so young. Um, you know, it really is. Uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, India is a young country. There is no reason, really, for um, 
the hate that we see on the internet and on uh, on Main Street in India to spill over the way it does. And, and just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here, um, there are two things really. One is really amid the, the rising tide of nationalism in India with the government that we have in power, uh, which is a BJP-led uh, government, um, there's, there's a real sense of um, of, of sort of uh, division between you know Hindus and Muslims or you know other religions and minorities. There's a sense of um, you know on on the internet, of course, you have uh, the creation of echo chambers uh, similar to what we have here in the West, mm -hmm. but but in a sense more dangerous in India in that um, India may not be as equipped to deal with it uh, in in ways that I think the West has has gotten used to dealing with, uh, so with these things. So how has the internet been used? How's WhatsApp or Facebook, how's it been used to either spread violence or stop violence? Well, sadly, it's mostly to spread hmm. um, violence. And so to give you an example, uh, the messaging app WhatsApp has really sort of become this sort of crucible for spreading fake news, rumor, uh, and, and um, inciting violence in India. And this usually begins with something that could be adopted video or it could be uh, a news story that isn't quite true, um, alleging that, you know, maybe uh, Muslims in this particular region have done something that would offend Hindus. Hindus then see that and then, uh, you know, obviously the, the message spreads exponentially. For those of you who haven't used WhatsApp, you can get a message and you can send it to, well, in the, before WhatsApp began to limit it, you could send it to 100, 200 people on, on your uh, list of contacts. Um, and then that would exponentially get sent to other people. And that's how fake news in India spreads. And it had consequences. It had real consequences. It had real life there, consequences. There were, um, just to name one case of, uh, you know, in a village outside Delhi, um, a man called, a Muslim man called Muhammad oh, Akhlaq like. was, uh, it was alleged that he had beef uh, in his home. Um, and irrespective of the fact that he did or he didn't, uh, you know, uh, and he actually didn't, um, but it led to a mob of people uh, going to his home, beating him up and killing him. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, those kinds of instances of lynch mobs, you know, feeling angered by something that could offend them, these things have, in a sense, always happened in India, but they are being weaponized. Mm -hmm. um, by social media and the internet uh, in a way that would have not been possible five or ten years ago. And um, just to wrap this point up, the reason why <coughs> it is as pernicious as it is, is, I mean, all of you probably discovered the internet in the 1990s. Your first email address was probably a hotmail address, and you got chain mails, and the chain mails would tell you, you know, if you don't send this on to ten people, you'll be unlucky in love, and lo and behold, you send it to 10 people and a friend yeah. says, you shouldn't do that, you learn, and you evolve with that, right? So you, you figure out trial and error. And it happens bit by bit. Well, India isn't going through that evolution, it's going through a revolution. You have hundreds of millions of people who've just discovered the internet, who don't know that you shouldn't just forward everything you see. They don't have the same levels of media literacy or digital literacy, and they forward things, and that leads to uh, violence and lynchings uh, and all kinds of things that are really dangerous um, for India um, and then to come back to your point um, end up fomenting uh, divisions and uh, hatred in a way that a country as young and you know as forward-looking as India should be shouldn't face. So this is a challenge for government officials. It's also a challenge for WhatsApp. Right? Yep. So how has WhatsApp dealt with this? Facebook owns WhatsApp. How has the government dealt with it? And what can the government do? I'd like to hear from both of you. You know, what are the, what are the legal, uh, wh where's the legal space here for restricting these kinds of, this kind of content? Sure. I mean, okay. uh, I'll, I'll just start by that. saying what WhatsApp has done. It's limited the number of people you can forward a message to. I think it stands at 20, 20 right now. Yeah. But even so, do the math. 20 is that times 20 to times India? 20, I think it is. Right? Yeah. So yeah. it's specific yeah. to it's India. It's specific to India, right. um, which they which can Which is, again, do it's tricky for yeah. a company, right? To it have country specific rules. It is. Right. 
Um, but they can do that. And yet it probably still isn't enough because mm. 20 times 20 times 20, you know, the numbers grow very, very quickly. Um, so there's that. Um, um, on, uh, you know, and I'd love to defer to you on what governments can do, but I'll, I'll just say one quick thing. You know, um, one of the analogies I make in my, my book is about how the car transformed America uh, in so mm -hmm. many different ways for another generation of young Americans in terms of the infrastructure physical that it created, which you all know, roads and highways and, uh, you know, everything from gas stations to the drive-in, um, but also the imaginative uh, um, sort of uh, infrastructure for Americans in terms of, you know, the race and freedom and all those things that the car ended up meaning for Americans. But to take that analogy um, uh, one step further, um, the way in which governments around the world have spent so much money on advertising around not drinking and driving or wearing a seatbelt when you drive is an example of how you, know, you, you, you acknowledge that a car is a useful tool, but it can be a weapon of mass destruction. And I think phones are similar in that sense, where they are incredibly useful they can be misused. And, and at some stage, the state does need to step in to raise awareness, you know, create digital literacy programs, so on and so forth. So I'm going to say a couple of things. One, I think the, um, the, the problems that India is facing with social media and the role of social media in um, exacerbating and in some cases being a route to incitement of violence, I think are also taking place within this larger context of social media universally or maybe globally. Yeah, it's happening elsewhere Yeah, too. it's happening elsewhere, right? Um, so that's one. I think if, um, if I have a cause for optimism, when I, when I look at India, it comes from the court. And I think, um, you know, wh when we look to institutions of constitutional governance, in India, um, we, we, uh, the Supreme Court has given us um, a, a way, I mean, we are able, and my clients were able, to go to the court to, um, you know, to, to say that we are minorities, the, um, that we deserve protection, we deserve constitutional protection, and this was in a situation where successive governments had not acted, right? So you um, uh, had not seen, um, successful legislation in India to overcome sections like Section 377. And that had, it had become quite clear that that was not a route that was available to us. So um, my point here is that when, when, I, you know, when, when I look to what the future is and how different institutions have responded to these issues, um, my cause for optimism, because, you know, and I also feel as a lawyer, um, you know, and maybe this is what um, separate, that, you know, distinguishes me from the journalists. You, when, when clients come to you, you want to think about how can they win and, um, you know, how can they be successful and, and what are the avenues to, to get them to the lives that they hope to live in this big and complicated country. And I think the court is really going to emerge and, and is emerging as... Um, you know, the, the route to that, whether it's in terms of, I mean, you know, even if we just look to the court's last term, um, there's, there's Section 377. They've said that women have a right to enter the temple. They have, you know, taken... This is a specific temple where uh, in, uh, yeah, for some in, years for, for, women for, were banned. For some years, women were not allowed to enter, and so they have uh, said that that's unconstitutional and that women have a right to, to temple entry, which is also... A, sort of larger, more historical But on this issue. issue of what can be said, right, on WhatsApp or on Facebook, yeah. India does have a law that says if you express an opinion yeah. that could, what is it, incite violence against a community, that that can be shut down. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Can, can you elaborate on, yeah, on that? Yeah, we have those. We have, um, you know, there are um, laws against hate speech. There are laws against, um, uh, you know, there, there were laws, in fact, which uh, regulated certain kinds of speech on the Internet, which the Supreme Court struck down some years ago. Um, the, this is a, um, you know, this is a definite problem. And under the BJP government, there has been a lack of regulation, without a doubt. But when, when I look to India and its survival as a constitutional democracy, I see the court as a beacon of hope.
And I think that's something that, that needs to be recognized. It's a delicate these. area for the court, for mm -hmm. the law, right. because India cannot have a firewall in the way that China can, right? It cannot have the kind of squelching of free speech that China does. Um, on the other hand, it's also got to be quite mindful of things that can foment um, mass violence. Um, and it has used laws on the books to squelch the expressions of journalists and cartoonists and writers and, and so on. It does seem like a very tricky area for India and the law, especially in the age of the internet. I wonder, James, if you have any thoughts on how companies, how internet companies are sort of navigating this rough water? It's an interesting, I mean, all across Asia, uh, you have the phenomenon that Ravi described, which is, um, in a sense, you plonk down social media on top of societies that do not have um, a robust public service media, um, and also which often have you know, et fragility, ethnic divisions or social divisions. And it's pretty clear that the effect of this is, is bad. I mean, there are positives to having Facebook and WhatsApp, um, but net net, I, I think um, the negatives probably outweigh them. And so far, the big um, American social media companies have been rather flat footed in the way they've responded to this. They have, uh, you know, under huge pressure, occasionally attempted to introduce minor changes to the way that their services operate, but they haven't shown any uh, real ability to grapple with the enormous power that they have. They, they've seemed to be kind of blindsided by the criticism that is given. But I think this, in a funny way, it speaks to a rather deeper point, which your original question um, alluded to, which, which was about, you know, why is it that you have this outburst of, of anger um, online and in other other places? And, and I put it down to, and I, I mentioned this a little bit in my book, I mean, it's a sort of funny, contradictory reaction to globalization. So India has gone through this very wrenching process of globalization. And, and one of the theories of this was that, in a sense, this would lead you know, young people in India to become more westernized, more global. And to some degree, I think that's happening. If you look at survey evidence, young people in India do tend to be more tolerant than their parents, um, less um, interested in old hierarchies. But on the other hand, you also see in India this explosion in interest in traditional forms of identity. Narendra Modi, his most fervent supporters tend to come from young people who are actually rather attracted, or young, young male Hindus who are attracted by the muscular vision of, of a modern technocratic Hinduism that he embodies. Um, Even if he doesn't create and, the and jobs. So yeah, I mean, I, I still think insofar as you can um, trust public opinion data in India, Modi remains very popular um, amongst young people, particularly in the in northern India, which is the kind of bedrock of, of his support. So, the, the, you know, the jobs are hard to put your finger on, but people like his the identity that he portrays. And this grasping on to, you know, this hunger for traditional forms of identity is something that's very marked in India. I mean, my book, The Billionaire Raj, is mostly about uh, rich people, but I include a chapter on India which talks about television news, the kind of wild uh, evening talk shows, but also a little bit about an author called Amish Tripathi who mm -hmm. writes, uh, again, incredibly popular uh, detective novels based on characters from uh, Indian antiquity, sort of the myths and legends of India's past. And these things sell hundreds of thousands, millions of copies, because amongst uh, young people in India who are, you know, reading books for the first time, whether they're reading them in paperback or on their phones, there's much more interest in, in reading uh, um, things about India's own heritage uh, than, you know, whatever might be your traditional view of, of kind of Indian based literature written by, by novelists who are popular in, in England or the United States. And so you have this upsurge in, of interest in traditional identity, some of which uh, bleeds over into violence and aggression. Some of that happens online, where the, the kind of armies of trolls who, who um, act for the BJP in particular are overwhelmingly young people. And some of it happens offline with the kind of um, violence that you've already been discussing. So I think a lot of that goes back to a rather contradictory attitude towards India's very rapid process of globalization. I bet your book will sell 
more than Anish Tripathi's. I, I think that's highly Mine unlikely. Mine may not. I think that's highly unlikely. Um, but Please. just to add one more point, um, I really liked your question about the state grappling with, with you know, being able to allow the, the freedom of the internet to flourish, but also to stop certain things um, from going wrong. And one of the areas that it grapples with the most is with internet shutdowns. Yeah. And, and these are cases where, you know, um, you know and, and the analogy to use again is if, if there's a road and there's a bomb blast on the road, you know, most police or government services will shut the road down to sort of cordon off violence. And India does the same thing with the internet. So if there's, uh, you know, a small encounter between the police and terrorists in, say, Kashmir, uh, they will shut the internet down in a very targeted way either in a, on a particular street or a city or even the whole state, yeah. which they've done for six months at a time. And India has more internet shutdowns than uh, Syria and Iraq, which are numbers two and three, which mm -hmm. gives you a sense of you know, how the Indian state can crack down when it wants to. Um, and the effects are pretty tough um, you know, to the extent that I think Brookings says that India, uh, Kash the state of Kashmir um, lost about $800 million worth of business uh, in 2016. Because of internet shutdowns. Because of internet shutdowns. Right. I remember before mobile mm -hmm. internet, the phones would be shut down. So you couldn't yeah. even text with each other. Yeah. And, I, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, a couple of years ago when I was researching my book, India was also number one among countries in requesting um, user information, yep. user data from internet companies. Um, so not only shutting down, but also extracting as much information as, as possible. Um, I want to leave lots of time for questions, but um, I, w I wondered if you all had just really quick thoughts on something that I was thinking about when I was walking here, and I, and I saw the marvelous show of uh, the progressive artists uh, a few weeks ago, and it occurred to me that that body of work that's on display here really represents the imagination of that, the generation we call Midnight's Children, right? The post-independence generation that my father belongs to. This generation that we're talking about, I, saw, I call them in my book Noonday's Children, as distinct from Midnight's Children. And I, I wonder if you all have any thoughts on what this generation means for India's history, how transformative they might, be, they might be, and in what direction they might take what is still a pretty young country. I think, um, you know, Noonday's children or, uh, or the smartphone generation or whatever you want to call it, um, I think this generation will end up being the most consequential genera generation for India's future. And the reason is that, you know, I mean, for the last 15, 20 years, we've, you know, outside of India, we keep hearing that India is going to take off or it's finally going to be the next China or the next great economy. And, and each time it's sort of flattered to deceive. Um, and um, for this generation, I think there's a moment that, uh, you know, and, and James was, was talking about this as well. One of the reasons why they sort of were seduced by Modi's uh, rhetoric three years ago, uh, well, four years ago Almost now, years ago. Um, was that he said, look around the world and, and, you know, look at what Singapore was 30, 40, 50 years ago and, and look at what they've become. I can give you these things. Mm -hmm. I can give you development and infrastructure and a smartphone in every hand and a job for every Indian. Of course, those promises haven't come true. But, but from what I've seen, young Indians like to dream. They, they just have yeah. immense outsized dreams. Um, they are very ambitious. They um, really feel that they could live different lives from the lives from their that their parents yeah. lived, um, which is such a change given India's history. And, and so you take all of that together with, with modernity, with access to information and the smartphone and all of these tools that in some senses level the playing field for this generation of Indians in a way that wasn't true for a previous generation. And you build all these expectations. And I think there's a real worry of disappointment. Uh, and we may see some of that in the next election, which is in May of next year, 
but we may see more of it in the years to come. And that's, that, I think that's a real worry for India moving forward. So I'm going to say again that I'm an optimist, you know. <laughs> People come to me and, and they want to win and sometimes they do win and, and they win because um, constitutional institutions have come through for them to say that the constitution belongs to them and that the constitution has a vision of Indian society in which they belong. So um, if, if I look at my young clients as a parameter of this generation. I think they're deeply aspirational. And they believe that the lives that they aspire to, that they can live that life in India. That they don't necessarily have to, leave, have to leave this country. Mm. To, um, uh, and, and by this country, I mean my country and India, um, to live that life. Um, that they are entitled and that they can, that the future holds that promise. For them, and um, and they will and they'll make it happen. They, you know, for um, the the median age of my clients was younger than 27. It was 23. My youngest client was wow. 19 years old. Um, you know, some of them came out to their parents and their families and their communities through the process of deciding to be petitioners before the Supreme Court to overturn a law that is 157 years old and was 157 years old. So they're deeply aspirational, and they believe that they can change, that they can change the country. James? Yeah, I think you can overdo the, the pessimism. There is a risk that you look at India and all of its many challenges and, and see, in a sense, the, the circumstances that led to something like the Arab Spring, a wellspring of frustration and obstacles and barriers. But as Ravi said, I mean, at a very basic level, India's situation, in one sense, is better than in Western societies like the United States or my home in the UK, in as much as people are going to do better than their parents. This, this sort of the enervating effect of having a feeling that your generation isn't going to do as well as the last generation, which saps the, the kind of spirit of Western economies at the moment, is not true in India. There's an enormous sense of possibility and optimism about what life could be like. And in a sense, it's it's one of the the great things about reporting in India that you know you can go to the to a very uh, deprived slum in in Mumbai where I used to live and still it's hard to find the sense of desperation that you would find in a housing estate um, in Washington D.C. or the outskirts of Glasgow. Um, uh, but I think people have to grapple with the the kind of aspiration that this younger generation um, wants. So in my book, um, one of the characters I talk about is Vijay Malia. The the charismatic billionaire, airline tycoon, brewer, and now absconder from justice in London. I mean, he's a very charismatic kind of piratical figure. But in a sense, the, the life that someone like BJ Malia offered, uh, which was one of you know fun, enjoyment, alcohol, women, international travel, was very appealing to young Indian men. I mean, this was a, a different sense of aspiration, one that, you know, is interested in, in cricketers and Bollywood film stars and maybe Sonny Leone, as we said at the beginning. And in a sense, kind of grappling with what the, the, this younger generation in Middle India wants out of life and why it is that it might become frustrated if maybe some of those aspirations aren't met, I think is the, the critical challenge, not just for people like us, but also for politicians like Modi. Yeah, aspiration is something that came through in in each of your remarks. And I have to say, one thing that I learned in writing my book about India's young is this, particularly this generation, um, is that aspiration is like water. It can nourish, but when unchecked, it can be absolutely devastating. Um, so I want to hear from the audience and from our audience online. Do you want to pass the mic? And you've got some index cards. Uh, my fervent wish is that you ask a short question, one question, um, so that we give all of us um, a chance to ask questions. Thanks. Um, your choice. So I'll hand go up in the back, right there. In the back. Hi, my name's uh, Anubhav Gupta. I actually work here at the Asia Society Policy Institute. And I had a question about gender issues. So on two issues, 
One being women's labor participation rate, which has gone down in India and ha that's mystified a lot of people. Uh, and second, on sexual violence and the you know, nascent Me Too movement in India, how do you see the aspirations of this youth generation uh, impacting both of, those, uh, both, of the, both of those issues? Thank you. Can I just clarify your question? Was it electoral participation or labor force participation? Labor, labor force participation. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on this, James. But it is uh, a real conundrum that as education goes up for girls um, and young women, college graduation rates go up. Paradoxically, um, labor force participation is going down. And it is a real, um, it is a real mystery uh, that uh, I'm not sure that we have a quantifiable answer for. Um, I think there are people who have some real hunches about the depth of um, uh, the depth of misogyny in Indian society uh, and mm. how that impacts even middle class families um, willingness to to let women work um, but what can be quantified is the cost to the Indian economy. I think the World Bank has, um, has actually put a dollar figure on this. James, do you have this at your fingertips? What it actually costs the Indian economy because women are not working in the formal labor force? I don't have that figure. Um, I can. I mean, I think it's pretty clear what's going on. I don't think it's actually much of a mystery at all. You have two separate things, uh, one of which involves uh, women who are very poor. And so if you think about that, you know, most most women who work in India are poor. And so if you imagine your image of the worst conditions of a sort of female worker in India, somebody with a you know, pallet of bricks on their head working on a roadside or, or hoeing a field, um, the reason why labor participation declines is when people become a little bit richer, then social conventions suggest that women should not do those kinds of work. Um, and so very poor women work out of desperation or, you know, the fact they have to, you know, do whatever they can. But then when their families get a little bit richer, then the women get pulled out of the labor force and they don't start going back in um, until the families become much richer. Um, you know, they become kind of lower middle class. And at that point, it becomes it begins to become acceptable for women to work again. And in a sense, you can you can understand to some degree why that is. But um, that's not an issue of of kind of prejudice or misogyny in an obvious sense. It's the social convention that women should not do backbreaking work in manual labor or agriculture. There's a separate issue which um, affects a much smaller cohort of, in a sense, upper middle class women. And that I think is predominantly to do with, uh, and that's the kind of people who, you know, we would probably know people who were lucky enough to go to good um, educational institutions. And that's what happens when you approach uh, having children. So professional women in India quite often work, um, you know, as, as their male peers and then drop out of the labor force when they first have children. And that that's affects a far smaller cohort of women. You know, you, you're talking only a, a few million who are in that sort of um, position. But nonetheless, that that is a problem because um, in, in that case, and more generally, uh, there's a uh, you, you you could significantly increase the the size of the Indian economy and its vibrancy of some of these women who, for whatever reason, were deciding not to work or not given the opportunity to work, mm -hmm. um, enter the economy. And as you say, the World Bank and the OECD have provided quite compelling evidence of this, even if we don't have the exact figures at our fingertips. I don't think you want to add something to this. You know, I mean, I was just thinking about the. Um the Me Too um, moment that you referred to. Um, and um, um, there have been a number of women who've come forward to speak about sexual harassment in journalism. Um, and it's actually interesting that, uh, that I think that was the, the trigger for that was also a young woman um, talking about her experiences. And then it sort of um, um, you know, exploded. Uh, and I, you know, I, one of the things that I um, hear that also really resonates is that, uh, you know, we're entitled to uh, to working conditions that are free from sexual harassment at one end of the spectrum and and sexual assault um, at the other. And and also, I, I see a generational shift there as well. So that's that's my. 
On the um, gender violence question, um, remember, this is kind of like a second, um, um, it's like the second wind, right? Yeah. The, the, the first moment when violence against women really got huge public attention is, of course, in December 2012, um, gang rape of a young woman uh, who was the first in her family to go to college, uh, was going to, you know, step into the middle class, live a life very different from her parents, um, and these aspirations, her dreams were cut short by um, a brutal physical assault. And what really struck me, I was in India during that yeah. time, and what really struck me in the weeks and months afterwards um, was that at first the, the politicians were a bit tone deaf. Um, mm -hmm. The leaders didn't quite know how to deal with it. But uh, street protests continued on uh, again and again and again. Um, there was a sort of blue ribbon panel that was appointed finally by the, the prime minister. And that incident really unleashed the pent up frustrations um, of a lot of women who from that time onward seemed to be saying, we're not going to keep quiet about this anymore, right? For generations, um, uh, whether it was um, harassment when you're traveling to school by bus, whether it was uh, uh, abuse by a male colleague, whether it was violence at home, which is the most common. common form of violence that faces women all over the world, frankly, including India. Um, it seemed to me after that December 2012 yeah. incident, yeah. there was just a chorus uh, by Indian women saying, we're, we're not going to be quiet about this anymore. There was a, a good question that came through via email about um, will a younger generation finally wipe out caste discrimination? Big broad question. I wonder if anyone <laughs> wants to take it on. Um, caste discrimination is, of course, outlawed right, by law. Uh, untouchability, as it were, is prohibited. Um, and yet the social customs continue. Um, discrimination is, is prevalent on, on caste grounds. Um, and I, I don't know whether, whether social norms are changing quantifiably, visibly, um, over caste. It's hard to say, and this is such a big, tough topic for, I think, any of us to really weigh in on conclusively. But I, I think the way to see it is that India is going through so much churn, um, and there are so many different catalysts that are leading to this churn, um, ranging from the youth bulge to urbanization through to technology to rising income levels to more consumption to the ability uh, of people to you know uh, use those things and and be socially mobile and change their circumstances so there's so much that's happening all at once and i think organically um there will be uh less uh of an emphasis on you know people seeing cost differences the way they do uh and i think those changes will be intangible over time um you know and and Differences in, in cost are are not always as obvious as you may think. I mean, sometimes you you know someone's cost simply by 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 knowing their name, uh, you know. Um, and and I think those things won't necessarily go away. I think that that legacy will always exist. But I I do have a sense of optimism on this that you know I think younger Indians have a desire to to modernize and to change their country. And you see that in so many different ways. Uh, and I think this will be one aspect of that change over time. There was a question over here. A woman had, a, woman had her hand up. Did you change your mind? There was a question over here? No, OK. There's a question here. <clears throat> I'm, I'm Philip Oldenburg. And the question that I have is, uh, some have argued that India is different from the rest of the world in many ways because of its uh, the familial self 
the family ties, the extent to which people identify as part of their families and remain uh, in that. And I'm wondering whether uh, this generation uh, has those, that sense of being familial uh, to the extent that previous generations did. I wonder if one way to address that question would be um, when some of these young students, college students, came out for the first time, mm -hmm. right? Were they afraid that their families would shun them? Um, did their families back them up in the end? No, I'll give you an example. Hmm. So uh, one, of, one of my clients, um, uh, uh, is a PhD student now, having graduated, um, is now you know, uh, doing his doctorate at a university in the United States. And um, he came, he flew down for the hearing. So he flew from, you know, wherever he is, to Newark, Newark to Bombay, Bombay to Delhi, for a day, you know, for a few hours. Um, to hear this case being argued in court, which is a lot of flying for six hours of arguments, because his parents told him that he was making history and that he should be there. So I think, um, you know, people have very different experiences, and um, everyone has a journey, right? I mean, our families also have a journey. Um, especially when it comes to sexual orientation. And I, I like, again, and the court has recognized that um, with this case. So I think there is change. You know, to, to respond to, to the earlier question as well, I mean, one of the questions that we got uh, often after the, the judgment was pronounced was, well, you have this, this glorious judgment, but will society change? And I think society is also change through the process by which minorities change. Um, you know, and um, in, in, the, in, in the question of caste in India, that's not a minority um, yeah. question, um, which is one of the reasons why I think also electoral politics has been so important to that story of, tra of transformation. Um, but, um, you know, family remains important, but families also change. Family remains incredibly important in business, as James, I'm sure um, you can testify. Yeah, no, it's a great question. That was immediately the answer that popped into my head. I mean, in a sense, the, the characters that I deal with in the billionaire Raj, almost all of them uh, come from family controlled businesses. And, and there was a sense that it, it goes a little bit back to the way we were discussing, discussing globalization earlier, that there has been a, a theory um, around the place that India, as it globalized and modernized, that some of these more traditional aspects of its society would melt away, be that um, traditional identities, or in this case, the preponderance of family-owned conglomerates mm -hmm. as a kind of dominant business force. Um, but if that is going to happen, it certainly isn't happening yet. I mean, there's no great sign of this. The the the, the lock hold of family owned businesses on the heart of India's economy remains pretty much as strong um, as it ever was. That doesn't mean to say that there aren't some companies out there that look like Western publicly owned corporations, but it's not as if I think you can say that they're taking over. And so the, the strength of this form of business organization, which is sometimes linked to caste or geographic background or, or particular kind of identity groups, um, is as strong um, as it has ever been. I, I think you could maybe look, thinking of the younger generation and the kind of characters who appear in Ravi's book, you could maybe look at Bangalore and the startup scene there and see the beginnings of a different kind of organization um, emerging where most of the startups that are formed look more like Silicon Valley um, mm. tech enterprises than they do the, the traditional mm -hmm. family-owned um, promoter uh, a sort of organization as, as they're called. But I don't see that spreading too far beyond the tech sector at the moment. And so if it's going to, it's going to be a, a gradual process.
progress. Family business in India seems as, as strong as it's ever been. I'm curious, um, are there many of these family businesses where um, it's passing down to a daughter? Any examples there come are, to there mind? There are some. I, I, I think it's more acceptable now. Uh, previously, this would have been unacceptable. Uh, you know, this would almost never have happened. But mm. nowadays, you see uh, daughters and sons working together. Um, so, for instance, the most famous business family in India, the Ambani's, who are um, the Mukesh Ambani, the richest man in India, the richest man in Asia. Uh, he <clears> has three children. Um, and the two who are most prominent are, are uh, son and daughter twins. Um, the assumption is that the son, I think, will take over eventually. But nonetheless, the, the daughter is, is fairly prominent and, and kind of has a role in the company. And that's true elsewhere. There is a kind of slightly gendered split, I would say, where typically the sons end up kind of running the meat and drink of the business. And often the daughters end up with sort of marketing functions or maybe something to do with with philanthropy. Um, and so there remains a kind of gender divide, I think. But you do see more. Uh, more prominent uh, daughters in these family-owned conglomerates. It's not as if it's only the sons who take over now. Yeah, it'd be fascinating to see what this generation of daughters, yeah. you yeah. know, does in another 10 years or 20 years compared to their brothers. Um, one more question. There's one here. Okay, two more questions. One here, one there. Okay. Uh, referring to the discussion earlier about how to control the harm that the Internet uh, may cause, uh, that's a question that's now not only in India, but all in this country and all over the world. In this country, it, it's unacceptable to deal with that by having the government tell you what you can put on the Internet or what not. And as a result of that, people are now thinking about maybe the companies themselves should be censoring. I wonder what the constitutional issue is in India. I mean, in the United States, the Constitution prohibits some government official telling you what you can put on the Internet or not. Is that true in India, or is there a role that the government does play in censoring that goes beyond, that's allowable under the Indian constitutional system? And if not, is there any chance that the private companies are going to, on their own, do some censoring or control of the Internet? So the, the technical answer is that the right to free speech is constitutionally protected, and it's subject to what are called reasonable restrictions in the interest of, um, amongst others, um, you know, uh, morality, um, public order, and so on. Um, you know, I, I think, in general, governments exert different kinds of um, pressures on what people say. So aside from straight out directives, um, you know, if you know that at an immigration point, um, your social media accounts are subject to be checked if they're open on your phone, um, then there's, there's that playing out every time you post something or like something or, or tweet out something. Um, Within those parameters, I, I will say again, I think the court has has uniformly almost said that free speech is protected against government intrusion in India. So that's that's the lay of the land. One last question back there. Um. I have a question specifically for Arundhati, but um, I guess for everyone. I know that you were talking earlier about the rise of anti or sentiment towards um, ethnic minorities, and you've been talking about how the courts are a sense of hope. And one thing that um, I would love to hear you comment on is the current case against deporting the Rohingya, um, who are an ethnic minority that I believe that Modi's government has um, ordered the deportation of Rohingya, and I was just wondering if you could comment on that as kind of a barometer of the power of the courts or how they're limited in their, in their scope of being able to, to do good in that sense. So I'm not aware of the specifics of the case, um, so I'm, I'm not able to 
kind of offer a specific comment. Um, but you know, but to give you a, a general Im impression that I have, I think um, what you know what one tends to see his historically um, um, with constitu with constitutional courts per se, I mean, as, as a kind of feature of constitutionalism, is that um, strong, go strong governments tend to, um, um, you, know, the, you, you know, you tend to see strong governments and weak courts, and sometimes vice versa. I think what's really remarkable about this particular constitutional moment in India is that the court is um, really, um, I mean, they've said, in um, you know again in the Johar judgment that constitutional morality will prevail against um, public morality and and you know in that way they are defining themselves right now as an institution of uh, constitutional governance with a very strong government in power as well so I you know I, I think as a as a broader question that that's how I see the framework. Do you want to add anything on this? James, anything you, you would like to say before no, we no. let you go on to your morning in Singapore? No, I think uh, thank you very much for having me. It's been a great discussion. So thank, thanks so much. And uh, I have my whole day ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> we have the bar ahead of us. <laughs> so with that, um, I want to thank all of you for joining. And uh, please join us at the bar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.